the Latin word for desire is desiderare, and it means away from your star. So when there's desire, there's some sense of being away from home and a longing for homecoming. And that, feel, that feels kind of intuitively true. That I think of it that this, our star is the energetic source of our being, the awareness that's the source of our being. And we have a longing to come home to our true nature, to really rest in our wholeness. When our attention's been fixated, as for most of us we have our fixations, you know, whether more money, more food, more approval, how do we shift from that outward fixation to really that light and warmth of awareness that's right here? How do we undo the conditioning to fixate outward? And there's two steps that we have to repeat 10,000 times, you know, that any mastery of anything takes many repetitions. And one is to keep pausing in the midst, So that whenever you sense that the hungry ghost energy, whenever you sense, okay, going after approval here, or okay, I'm fixating on more money or status or prestige or different body or whatever it is, pause. There's an AA sponsor who describes the sacred pause. He says that um, it's worth, you know, two years of meetings, that just a pause of 10 seconds the amount of freedom that's possible. And of course it's not either or, because we need both. But that's the first step, is that we need to have that kind of commitment, that getting, well, these attachments are running my life, are keeping me from my full life, keeping me from feeling that that light and that, that soul force that's here. Pause. Be willing to pause. Now sometimes you'll pause And then the next step is deepen your attention. Pause and deepen your attention. That means awaken these two wings we talk about regularly of mindfulness and heartfulness. We pause and we say, so what's really happening here? And we bring a kind attention. And sometimes it will work so powerfully that we can absolutely change our patterning in that moment. And sometimes we go back to the old patterning, but each time we repeat it, we're on some level deconditioning the habit. So let me uh, give you an example of a woman I worked with that, um, that came in who was very much that kind of sense of a hole in my soul that something's really wrong with me. And uh, she, she basically said, well, everything I, I do I fail at and I hate myself and I'm ashamed of myself and then I end up, you know, smoking too much weed and drinking too much alcohol, and drinking was the worst problem. She said she had gone to AA, knew she needed to go back. Her closest friends were really encouraging her to go back. Um, But it was really, she just couldn't convince her to stop using. So I asked her to get right into it, like, okay, in the moments when you have to have, and this is a really important inquiry, to go right into all right, in the moments when I'm really, it really matters what another person's thinking, or I have to have that bowl of ice cream, or whatever the false refuge is, what's going on inside you then? And when I asked her, she said it was kind of like this heart pounding, like she was about to get something she really wanted, like the anticipation of the, the satisfaction. And there was a shortness of breath, but along with that there was also kind of a scared feeling, like I might not get it. And... And then I asked her to keep investigating, because part of mindfulness, the wing of mindfulness, is to really investigate. And I said, you know, the part that's compelling you, what is it? So it feels like this clutch and this heart pounding. What does it look like? And she said it has a black, piercing, evil eye, and it's in the middle of this dark, shadowy shape. Okay, so that's what she had. So I said, okay, go inside that, you know, and sense what is that part really wanting? Because asking that question, it's part of a mindful investigation. What does this compelling place really want? And she asked and said, it wants me to drink and drink and drink. And then I said, well, what will that do? What is it really wanting? What does it want the drinking to do? Well, then I'll feel relief. Then I'll feel better. It wants relief. And I said, well, okay, what will that do if you feel relief? And then she said, ah, then that part will feel lovable. 
I can really relax and feel relief, I'll feel lovable. So I asked her, can you give that part some love right now? Heartfulness, remember? Mindfulness and heartfulness. Can you just... And she said, I don't feel like I have any love to give. And so I asked her, the next step to heartfulness is, well, if you don't have the love to offer yourself, and we often put our hand on our heart and sense, you know, loving ourselves, who might or what might in the universe? And she said, well, my, my two friends and that, you know, keep trying two friends that keep trying to get me to go to AA, and also my mom. So I said, okay, put your hand on your heart and and let their love come in. So she did that for a while. And I said, let their love go right to where that that creature, that, you know, it's kind of like her version of the hungry ghost, Let let it go right in there to that part of you that doesn't feel lovable. And after a while she said, okay, now I'm feeling more loving. And and what I said, what's the creature like now? She said, well, it's shrunken and its black eye is sad. It's glistening tears. I said, give it more then. Let it, let it have even more love. And she said, oh, my stomach's loosening. I can breathe. Real relief. And then she kept going a bit more. But this is what she did many rounds of. I'm giving you an example of what she did. Every time she'd feel the urge to drink, um, she would pause and she would feel her body and feel those feelings and sense that kind of compulsion part in her and sense what it wanted and offer love. And she said that sometimes it was enough that the craving would kind of come, because cravings have a kind of you can chart them. They rise. There's a vector. They rise. They have a peak, and then they fall away. If you can wait long enough, you can wait them out. Most of us can't. But um, so sometimes the craving would come and go, and she could actually make a healthier choice. And other times she couldn't. But over time, she started beginning to loosen the grip. Also, want to say she needed AA. So it wasn't. This, I'm describing the inner work of bringing the two wings. But we also need that relational field to support us, and for her it was quite important. I remember her describing uh, her last, uh, on our last time we got together, she had, at this point she was a sponsor, and she said she understood spirits. She said that she was driven to it to have an experience, she was driven to the alcohol to have an experience that's driven to spirits. But the real spirit she needed was what she found when she brought presence to her own heart. And that that evil eye, that gleaming spirit eye, was really her source of wisdom and love. This is her experience. And not all of us have such a, the kind of imagination that, that can feel what kind of a creature is represented. Some of us do. But what we all have, and this is where the deep invitation is, is that our attachment and addiction can be a flag to pause and deepen our attention to what's here. And if we're willing, if there's willingness, we can't will it, you cannot will yourself out of an addiction, but if there's a willingness to pause and deepen your attention, you can begin to discover that rather than the pat addictive habit that you are hitched to, you can be dis- begin to discover that that star you felt away from really is here. It's in the presence. It's right here. Right here. 